My name is Alex George and I'm an Ansible specialist and I'm going to be walking through different Ansible development environment options so you can streamline some of your playbook creation. So when we look at the different development options, I generally like to divide them into two different categories. Things that I can install locally and manage, so that's generally looking at Python virtual environments or Docker and Podman desktop. So if I'm doing Python virtual environments, that would be using Ansible Playbook plus Ansible Core, any collections that I need and any Python additional packages or system packages I need. Or I can leverage Docker or Podman Desktop plus Ansible Navigator to leverage execution environments. I generally only see this in smaller companies or individuals just trying to write automation for themselves, mainly because trying to manage Python virtual environments doesn't really align with execution environments of those pieces. And also at the corporate level, I often find WSL isn't authorized. So all of those options really aren't available for a customer or a company that has Windows as their laptop or desktop. So that's where I start looking at the remote options. So really those remote options are code server, remote SSH with VS code, and then OpenShift dev spaces. And I'll dive into all those options to kind of what I see as the pro and cons of them. So Ansible dev code server, I look at as kind of a web hosted version of VS code. So it's leveraging an op upstream project that I can download, install. I actually have a playbook that can do this entire process. So I can install code server, Ansible Navigator, make sure Podman is available, make sure any re repositories that I wanna leverage are all there. I could also leverage a shared image storage. So if I have multiple users leveraging the same server, I can set up shared image storage so I don't have 15 different copies of the exact same execution environment. The nice part about this is nothing needs to be installed on your laptop. I just need a web browser. Doesn't really matter what web browser it is, as long as I can reach that URL. There are some caveats though. The way it works is it only has a password authentication available to it, and it's not tied into any sort of authentication source. So if you wanna have regular password rotation, or you need to have users tied into Active Directory or some sort of LDAP source, doesn't really work with this code server. Also, every single user has a separate port because, again, it is web hosted. So as you start adding in more users, it certainly be, can become more difficult to manage, especially if you have to open up additional firewall ports for every single user. So I like to use this for myself because I'm generally one person writing automation. I would say one or two people in a business writing automation could probably leverage this. But it's outside of that, I'd probably steer more towards the next option if I really only have virtual machines available to me. And that is the VS Code Remote SSH extension. So this actually leverages SSH to perform that development on a remote server. In this case, I could actually use the exact same server setup that I had for the code server web-based. I would still leverage a playbook to install Navigator, Podbin, and all those other pieces. But now VS Code is installed on my laptop, and then I need an SSH client on that laptop to be able to connect into that remote environment. Because I'm leveraging SSH, I can leverage whatever privileged access management tool or LDAP users plus passwords and SSH keys. So if those are set to rotate on a regular basis, this takes advantage of that. I then also don't need to set up additional ports because all this is leveraging is SSH. So as long as I can SSH from my laptop or some sort of remote system into this environment, I could leverage this. Also, Lightspeed, the automation AI, does work with this remote SSH extension. So if you are trying to leverage Lightspeed as part of your automation development, it does help with the process. So I do like using the VS Code Remote SSH extension, especially if you're on virtual machines. There is still some setup required. So if you wanna make this really, really easy for the end user, where well, I don't have to set up Navigator, Podman, or manage EEs, the last option that I've leveraged is just leveraging OpenShift dev spaces or the upstream variant is Eclipse J if you don't have OpenShift. But really this gives you on-demand developer environments. So it leverages a UI right inside my Kubernetes platform that I can just stand up my development environment on demand directly from a repository. So I have multiple repositories and really all I've added into them is a dev file that points to my development execution environment. And then I also have just a settings and extensions.json that says, hey, here are the extensions that I wanna auto install after I stand up this environment. I did have to make some modifications to my execution environment. So Ansible Lint works. But really, it's a very easy process for the end user to just jump in, have everything available to them, spin up a environment on demand and end it on demand as well. And because as part of OpenShift Dev Spaces, I can set up my Git access both for container registries, Git SSH keys, and then my Git information 
it makes it very easy to also submit pull requests without really doing any additional work because that's auto injected into the environment that gets stood up. So it really can make this very easy for multiple users to leverage, though I have seen some instances where this can get resource intensive. But I would say if you do have a Kubernetes environment, this is probably the easiest one to set up overall and the easiest to manage long term because I can just keep updating those dev instances and those dev files without having to do too much additional work. One caveat I will add in is as of this date on February 20th, 2024, Lightspeed only works with the Red Hat hosted version of OpenShift dev spaces. So that's through developers.redhat.com. It currently does not work with on-prem deployed OpenShift environments, but that is something that is being worked on. So let's jump into what these look like and how I can gain access to these just to get a deeper dive on what's available. So jumping into the two browser-based options, I'll do the code server version first. So as you can see, I've got this host set on a virtual machine and it's part of the web URL. It's actually pointing to a specific folder, which is where I've set up all of my playbooks and repositories to automatically sync down. So I can do this from any web browser that conveniently has access to development server. It's behind for me a VPN, but as long as I'm logged in, I can gain access to this particular server. I've already gone through the process with my playbook to deploy this, to deploy Ansible Navigator, Podman, Git. I've made sure the Ansible extension is installed. All of those things are set up. So as soon as I basically open up this web browser, as you can see, it already detects that this is Ansible is leveraging the execution environment that I've set up using Ansible Core 2.15.9. I've got the syntax highlighted autocomplete automatically built in. So it's really a very quick and easy way for me to get started without having to do too much work as an end user, since again, I've got a playbook that goes to this process and I'll include that in a repository that I've got down below in the description. From the other side, I'm looking at OpenShift dev spaces. So this is just an operator that I've installed in my OpenShift environment. It's tied into my authentication. So I've got IDM as my auth source. So I'm just gonna log in as myself. And this gives me a blank environment as of right now, because I haven't deployed any of my different repos. But as I talked about before, I can set up preferences for myself as a user to tie into my private automation hub to have my Git config. So when I do commits, it actually uses my name and email. If I need an SSH key to pull from Git, I can place that in here as well, or a personal access token, depending on what works well for you. But I want to create a workspace from a particular repository. I can just stand up a blank Ansible one, which just has Ansible core. But personally, I have my own execution environment that I want to leverage. So I'm going to pull up this Ansible security repository that I have access to. All I have to do is click create and open. Now it's going to go through that process of building this environment using OpenShift dev spaces. So I'll stand up that VS Code IDE plus pull in this project automatically. So I won't have to do any additional work outside of that. So it's going to open up in this same window in that IDE. And because I've got in there an extensions.json uh, in this VS code folder, it will actually auto install those extensions for me as well. So as soon as this is all done and running, I'll be able to do all that syntax highlighting, have a terminal, everything that I would expect for an IDE. But in this case, it actually uses that exact project that I'm pulling from GitHub with all those pieces in there. So again, it's can streamline some of your development. And once this is done, I'll actually see it'll shift from plain text to Ansible and we'll use that exact same execution environment. So I'll be able to use that same uh, 2.15.9 EE. So again, streamlining some of my processes and just like I would expect, I do have a terminal. So to prove that this is you know, my execution environment, I'll do Ansible Galaxy collection list and you'll see all the collections that I have installed. So this is not just using an Ansible core only environment. This is using the execution environment that I've built with all my collections, including my custom collection that I've created. So again, this streamlines of my playbook development because it does give me all of that syntax highlighting, all of that autocomplete that I would expect in a normal IDE. The last option then uses your on-prem or laptop installed VS Code. So in this case, I've switched to VS Code, an application running my laptop, and all I've done previously is installed the remote SSH extension. And since I'm running on a Mac, I do have an SSH client installed. So I can simply go to that extension. I've already set this up to work with my server and I've got a specific folder that I want to open up into. So I'm just going to click this button because I have SSH keys already set up. I don't need to put in the username and password. It will open up that environment. And now I can do all my playbook development in here, but all the code itself lives on that for me, rel eight server in my environment. 
but I still get access to Git and all those other pieces that I've already previously installed. So as I talked about, because of the fact this is a VS code version of uh, the Ansible extension, I can actually use Ansible Lightspeed and all those different pieces. I can actually see in the bottom right corner, it does say Ansible Lightspeed license. So maybe I want to do some multitask generation. I want to create AWS security, uh, security group create and create EC2 instance. And because of the fact that, again, this is the laptop installed VS code, the Ansible Lightspeed works. So it will take that prompt and pass that in. So I do have that capability as I go through this. So you do have to decide based on your environment, your security requirements, as well as are you leveraging Ansible Lightspeed in its current state, which environment works best for you. But personally, this is how I develop all of my AWS automation for provisioning and deprovisioning. So it's definitely a great way to have Ansible Lightspeed and leverage something like the VS Code Remote SSH extension to have that capability. So just things to keep in mind as you go through this process. So this is a very quick overview of the different development options as I've used them. I will include in the description down below the repository that I have to set up both the VS Code Remote SSH extension, all the Ansible tooling on that NVM, as well as the code server version. In there, I also have a readme that walks through the setup that I did for OpenShift Dev Spaces, so if we do want to look into that. And I will include more detailed videos in the description walking through those three options as well. If you have some questions about what that VS Code Remote SSH extension is, I've linked that directly from the Microsoft Docs, so it can be very easy to follow along. But again, this is just an idea of how I can streamline some of my development processes. So no matter what operating system you're using as an end user, I can provide this to different teams, get them started much quicker, and provide some nice tooling with Ansible syntax, Ansible Lint, autocomplete, all the syntax highlighting. So there's less confusion in terms of getting started to really streamline some of your process, whether you're writing Linux, automation, storage, cloud, Windows, whatever your variant is, this really starts streamlining the process and ensures I'm using the execution environments that are available to me in the automation platform. So I know if it can work and find those modules as I'm going through with whatever my IDE is, I know will also work when I actually go through the process of running this in automation controller. So thanks for taking the time out to learn a little bit more about how I do all of my Ansible development today. And hopefully this can provide some new ideas as you start looking into onboarding new teams or new users and trying to improve how you're performing some of your Ansible development. Click my picture on the right to subscribe or click the image on the left to watch another video.